Hi everyone, and welcome to U University. I'm Dr. Kelly. Well, my first week of summer break has been filled to the brim. I, my, my husband and I are getting ready for a little getaway since our semester just ended last week, and we are looking forward to a little downtime. I'm looking forward to more knitting and crafting time this month. One thing on my crafty list is to finish putting my loom together and try my hand at weaving. I have a couple of weaving books that I'm going to use to get me started, and I picked out a bunch of yarn to use for my first weaving projects. I figured that there'll be some small items like placemats and coasters. Um, I don't know if I'll graduate to weaving an entire scarf by the end of May, but we'll see. I want to take a moment to thank all of you for the cards and letters that I've received in the past couple of weeks. Um, they've made my mailbox very happy. They've made put a smile on my face. Hearing from you guys really brightens up my day. And a special thank you goes out to an anonymous devoted fan in Seattle who wrote me this very sweet letter on beautiful paper. Thank you very much. Now I'm recording this a little bit early because I'm going out of town for a short time. So because I'm recording this a couple of days after I recorded the last video, um, I haven't made much knitting progress. So I'm not going to have a knitting segment today to show off my knitting but I'm quite sure that most of you are not watching my videos to see my knitting progress anyway, since I'm so slow, <laughs> and that is okay. For this video, I want to have a couple of quick segments, so let's get on to those. Over the past three or four weeks, I received several requests for me to review a knitting tool called Embellish Knit. And all of these people were having trouble getting this little knitting machine to work right. Here it is. And they asked if I could talk about it. And I actually happen to have one of these already, but I haven't used it in a long time. So I thought I'd get it out and play with it. The embellished knit is a little crank operated spool knitter. It's like a miniature circular knitting machine. It comes with a clip on weight a plastic tapestry needle, and an instruction sheet. It is basically used to make I-cord. Now I-cord became famous because of Elizabeth Zimmerman, the renowned knitting teacher and designer who revolutionized knitting with her television series on PBS in the 1970s. Now the I-cord technique has been around for nearly 200 years, but Elizabeth Zimmerman is the one who named it I cord and I cord stands for idiot cord. Apparently she happened upon the technique and called it the idiot cord or I cord because she thought it was so easy that anyone could do it. Now traditionally I cord has been knit on two double pointed needles using about three or four stitches. Here's an example of knitting I cord with three stitches just to show you how it's done. You cast on three stitches knit those stitches, and then instead of turning the work like you would normally do, you slide the stitches to the other end of the needle and keep knitting. And after every row, you keep sliding the stitches to the other end of the needle and then knit them. So essentially, you're knitting a tiny version of a tube without ever having to use circular needles because the tube is so small. It's only a few stitches. And that's what I-cord is. So this little spool knitting machine is supposed to make I-cord even easier to produce. It has four needles that are reminiscent of the needles on bigger knitting machines, like a flatbed knitting machine or a circular knitting machine. The needles are metal and have latches that open and close. On this spool knitter, the idea is that you insert the yarn through the middle of the spool and then turn the crank, which turns the spool inside in a circle, and also moves the needles up and down. When the needle is up, it catches the yarn and creates a knit stitch as the needle moves downward. In order for the spool knitter to work, keep in mind a few caveats. First, you can only use lightweight yarn. It cannot handle worsted weight or heavier yarn. You can only use DK weight, sport weight, fingering weight, or lace weight yarns with it. 
In my experience, the lighter and thinner the yarn is and the more twisted the yarn is, the easier it will be to use on this machine. Sock yarn seems to work pretty well. Second, the yarn going into the spool knitter cannot have any tension on it, none at all. It has to be moving completely free as it feeds into the spool. Third, you have to be sure to put weight on the yarn as it emerges from the bottom of the spool. And it comes with a handy weight that is shaped like a clothespin with a clip at the end, so it's very easy to attach to the yarn that's coming out. But as you work, be sure that the weighted clip doesn't rest on your lap or the countertop or the floor or anything like that, because without the weight pulling down on the cord, the machine won't work properly. And lastly, the handle is only supposed to be turned in one direction, and that is from the bottom towards you and then up over the top away from you. So from the bottom towards you, up over the top, from the bottom towards you, up over the top. All right, so let's try this little thing out. I'm going to use fingering weight yarn because I happen to have some that's left over from knitting socks, and this is a fun self-striping yarn um, that I think will be pretty. And it's a lightweight yarn that should work well in this small spool knitter. Now, before starting, make sure that all the needle latches are open. If the latches are closed, they won't pick up the yarn. The embellished knit machine comes with a plastic tapestry needle with a special head on it that is designed to push open the needle latches. So get some yarn off the ball and thread it through this small hole in the side of the machine. Then take the yarn up and through this little notch and then down through the tube in the middle of the spool. Thread it through the tube so that the yarn comes out the bottom and then attach the weighted clip. Now, when you first start the I-cord, you're going to have to hold onto the yarn so the weighted clip doesn't just pull it through the spool. But once you've got the I-cord going, you can let go of it. Are you ready? Let's make some I-cord. Now, I will say that the beginning of the I-cord is very fiddly, so you have to pay attention. On the first round, you're only going to let the yarn be caught by two of the needles, and those needles are going to be across from each other. Okay, so start turning the handle slowly until the first needle catches the yarn. Now, continue to turn the handle, but don't let the second needle catch the yarn. Using your tapestry needle or your finger, lift the yarn over and behind the second needle. Continue turning the handle slowly and let the third needle catch the yarn. And then continue turning the handle, but again, don't let the fourth needle catch the yarn. Push it over and behind that needle. So on this first round, the yarn should only be on the first and third needles. But now on all the subsequent rounds, you'll let all the needles catch the yarn. Keep turning the handle slowly and all of the needles will catch the yarn and they should start creating stitches. Once the stitches are formed and begin traveling down inside the tube, you can start turning the handle a little faster. And pretty soon you'll see the I-cord starting to come out of the bottom of the center tube. Make sure that you keep the weight on the I-cord and it even helps to pull down on the yarn coming out of the bottom to make sure that the stitches are forming. Also, make sure that the yarn going in doesn't get tangled up with the yarn coming out of the bottom and the clip-on weight. The I-cord will twist as it comes out the bottom and if it meets up with the incoming yarn, they will get all wound up together. As you continue to turn the handle, the I-cord will get longer and you'll need to move the weighted clip up periodically. Once you've made the I-cord as long as you want it, it's time to bind off. This is very easy to do. All you have to do is cut the yarn before it feeds into the guide. Turn the handle and the I-cord will be released from each of the needles and drop out of the bottom of the spool tube. Be ready to catch it. <laughs> Thread the yarn through your tapestry needle and thread it through each of the four loops left by the needles. Make sure you get the tapestry needle through all four loops. Once you've pulled the yarn through all four loops, then pull it tight and weave the end of the yarn into the I-cord. 
Now for this, I used a regular metal tapestry needle because the plastic one that comes with this little I-cord maker was kind of big and clunky. Now one thing you'll probably notice is that the beginning of the I-cord made on this machine is a little wonky. This has happened every time I made one. Um, the beginning's always goofed up somehow, but I still think it's usable because you could easily hide this little imperfection, I think. So there you've got your I-cord. I made a couple of different lengths of I-cord in just a few minutes. And what can you do with I-cord? A ton of things. You can make an I-cord rug, jewelry like bracelets or necklaces, different decorative knots. You could embellish a sweater, make purse handles, dog leashes, flowers. There's really no limit to what you can do with I-cord. And actually, the instruction pamphlet for this little spool knitter gives you some directions for how to make different knots, braids, and flowers with I-cord. So you can use your creative energy to think of some things you might want to use I-cord for. And that is how to use the Embellish Knits Spool Knitter. It's a handy little tool, but it is fiddly to use, especially in getting the I-cord started. If you're interested in checking out this little machine, I'll put a link in the description box below so you can check it out. I know they are available on Amazon for around $16, and you get the spool knitter, the clip-on weight, the tapestry needle, and a little bit of yarn to practice on, as well as the instruction sheet. Today in the classroom, I want to go over a topic that I covered in my audio podcast a few years ago, and that is how knitting is beneficial to mental health. So today let's start by going back to the late 1960s in a psychology laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Martin Seligman and his colleagues were interested in the transfer of a classically conditioned response to an escape situation. If you remember back to your introductory psychology course, you probably learned about classical conditioning. This is where an organism, like a human or a dog or a rat, comes to exhibit an innate behavior. This is the behavior that is automatic and doesn't have to be learned, like blinking or salivating or being afraid, in response to a new stimulus. So this is the stimulus that doesn't normally elicit the innate response. You can demonstrate this pretty easily in a class, and I've done this many times. You know, first the instructor brings out a pen, like this ballpoint pen. You know, and you ask the students, does anyone have any particular feelings about this pen? Are you feeling a little scared of it, or nervous about it, or love it, or anything like that? And of course they say, well, well no, it's just a regular pen, and they feel pretty neutral about it. Then you get out some balloons and pass them around to students in the class. You know, ask the students to blow up the balloons and hold them in their hands. As the instructor walks around the classroom with the pen in hand, you start popping balloons. And after even a couple of times, pretty soon the students start cringing every time you bring the pen out. You don't even have to pop the balloon. They start cringing just at the sight of the pen. But wait, they said they didn't have any particular feeling about that pen, yet now they're cringing whenever they see it. What just happened? Well, after a few balloon pops, the students learn to associate the pen with their startle response, and so that cringing became an automatic response to the pen. And that is called classical conditioning. Normally, we don't cringe whenever someone takes out a pen. But when people get classically conditioned for this, they do that automatic cringe response toward the pen. Okay, so back to Seligman's study. As I said, he was interested in classically conditioning an escape situation. So here's how his research team conducted the study. And it's a study on classically conditioning dogs. First, they conditioned a dog to fear a sound by pairing the sound with a shock. So every time the dog heard the sound, it got a shock. During this conditioning phase, the dog was not allowed to escape the shock, and not surprisingly, it soon became afraid of the sound preceding the shock. So the dog had been classically conditioned to exhibit fear to a sound. Then, after the initial conditioning, 
Seligman placed the dog into a two-sided chamber where he planned to train it to jump from side A to side B when it was shocked on side A. So when the dog was shocked, it would jump into the other side of the chamber. Makes sense, right? Seligman expected that because of the classical conditioning, eventually the dog would jump to the other side when only the sound was presented, thus avoiding the shock. However, he didn't even get that far in the study. To his surprise, when the dog was shocked, it did not respond as a dog normally does. It didn't try to escape the shock. Rather, it laid down and quietly whined. It just seemed to give up and to accept the shock passively. On every single trial, the dog didn't even try to escape the shock. So the research team couldn't continue the study to try to train the dog to escape only when the sound was heard. Now this passive behavior was obviously not expected. Why would the dog lie down and cry when it got shocked? Why wouldn't it try to escape the shock when it could? Well, because in the previous phase of the study, the dog couldn't escape the shock. At that time, no matter what the dog did, it couldn't change the situation. It couldn't get away from that pain. So it eventually learned that it was useless to try to escape the shock. And then when the dog actually had the opportunity to escape the shock, it didn't even try. Seligman named this phenomenon learned helplessness. Basically, a refusal to avoid trauma after experiencing repeated failures to control unavoidable negative events. In other words, when aversive events seem uncontrollable and inescapable, we stop trying to change them. This discovery led Seligman to investigate further and eventually applied his research on learned helplessness to the human problem of depression. He developed a theory of depression centering on the idea that depression was the result of someone repeatedly encountering unavoidable and uncontrollable, uncontrollable aversive events. The theory says that from an experience, an individual develops an expectation that what they do and what happens to them are not related. That is, no matter what they do, they can't escape the negative event. Seligman's original study was published in 1967. Now, fast forward 30 years later. Dr. Kelly Lambert, a neuroscientist and researcher at Randolph-Macon College in Virginia, published a book called Lifting Depression. In her book, she said that many years ago, she had attended a lecture by Martin Seligman, who was talking about a study from the 1970s, which compared older people and younger people on depressive symptoms. So who do you think reported more depression, younger people or older people? Well, Lambert says she thought this was a no-brainer. She reasoned that, of course, older people would have a greater likelihood of depression. After all, they've lived through wars, stock market crashes, the death of loved ones, and they haven't had all the technology which makes our lives so easy today. They've had to plow the fields with horses, bake cakes from scratch. They've had to work really hard and have experienced more suffering and hardship than the less traumatic lives of today's young people. But again, this was a case where the results of the study were not as expected. What Seligman reported was very surprising to Lambert. He said that younger people were much more likely to have experienced depression. In fact, he reported on studies which showed that young people are 10 times more likely to suffer from major depression than older people. And this got Lambert to thinking, what could account for this startling discrepancy? So she set out to find out. She wondered if the very technology that makes our lives easier could actually be bad for our brains. In one of her best known studies, her research team examined the connection between depression and physical effort. They studied rats and trained them to find a Fruit Loop, which is a favorite rat treat, in a mound of cage bedding. Every day, the researchers would construct little hills of bedding and hide a fruit loop in one of them. Then the rat would have to dig through the mounds to find which one contained the fruit loop. And the rats readily went to work and got quite good at finding their rewards. The researchers called these rats the working rats because they had to work for their reward. 
Now in this study, there was also a control group of rats, and these rats were placed in the same type of environment with mounds of bedding that the researchers had constructed. But instead of hiding the Fruit Loop treats inside the mounds, the researchers rewarded these rats with Fruit Loops delivered out in the open, in the corner of the cage. So basically, these rats didn't have to work for their reward. The research team called these rats the trust fund rats because they just had their reward delivered to them easily and without having to do any work. After five weeks, the working rats were compared to the trust fund rats in solving a difficult puzzle which involved having to get a Fruit Loop out of a toy ball. What happened was that the worker rats spent 60% more time trying to get the Fruit Loop and made more attempts to do so than the trust fund rats. Also, when the researchers tested the rats for a particular neuropeptide related to resilience, they found that the working rats had more of it than the trust fund rats. So a history of working hard to obtain rewards resulted in more effort and resilience while being handed out rewards without any effort resulted in less motivation and less persistence. This effort-driven reward training appears to have immunized the working rats against the learned helplessness often associated with depression. And Lambert calls this learned persistence. Dr. Lambert has gone on to conduct more studies and in 2008 published a book entitled Lifting Depression, in which she argues that working with our hands might be the best antidepressant of all. She says we have to use the effort-driven reward circuit in our brains or we become susceptible to depression. In her research, Lambert mapped out the parts of the brain that are involved in each symptom of depression, like reduced pleasure, more sadness, more fatigue, altered sleep cycles, worry, anxiety, etc. And she found that these areas of the brain are all adjacent to each other. For example, the nucleus accumbens, an area of the brain involved in pleasure, has close connections with the area of the brain that controls motor movements, as well as the part of the brain involved in decision making. This is probably not an accident. These brain regions are next to each other for a reason, because they're working together as a circuit. Using the circuit involves exercising our brain to plan and use both of our hands in tandem to create something that is rewarding to us. Today's humans are walking around with the same brains our ancestors had. Our brains have not had time to adapt to current technology because technology is changing and advancing so fast. She says that we're still carrying around a brain that appreciates working with dirt, planting, hunting, preparing food, working physically rather than pressing a button or popping a pill. So it's still very engaging and rewarding to our brain to think of something, to design something, and then use our hands to make it, and then see the result. Lambert talks specifically about knitting and other crafts as examples of this circuit in action. In fact, a hundred years ago, physicians used to prescribe knitting to female patients who suffered from anxiety because the physicians knew the activity was calming in some way. And today we know some of the reasons why this is. First, repetitive movements such as those involved with knitting, spinning, crocheting, and other fiber arts release serotonin, which is the exact neurochemical increased by antidepressant drugs, and this has a calming effect. Second, seeing a finished object, whether it's a gift for someone or something for yourself, is rewarding. Perhaps when you think about the happiness you'll bring to someone when you give it as a gift or by wearing it yourself. Third, counting stitches is a way to distract your mind from things you might be worried about. It forces thought away from anxiety provoking and stressful events. And fourth, using both hands in coordinated and complex ways while engaging the brain exercises that circuit in the brain. Lambert calls it mental vitamins. Research has found that just sitting around not using our hands, like when we passively watch TV, this numbs our brains and we're less motivated to do things. 
So when you're knitting or spinning or crocheting or weaving, you're exercising your brain and warding off depression. More recent experiments randomly assigned participants to either do something artistic with their hands or not to see if artistic endeavors reduce stress. And it does. The results showed that engaging in artistic tasks reduces stress more than engaging in non-artistic tasks. And in another study in 2016, young adults who identified themselves as makers reported higher subjective well-being. So in sum, science tells us that our mood will improve if the brain gets away from a sedentary way of life and engages in a more dynamic lifestyle. And the evidence points to working with our hands in artistic ways, like by knitting, crocheting, weaving, spinning, or doing other fiber artistry to reduce stress and ward off depression. Putting forth effort and engaging our brain in the process of building and creating something rewarding has a more meaningful impact on our emotions than antidepressant drugs. According to Kelly Lambert, when things are too easy, it's not good for our brains. Well, that brings us to the end of today's show. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the psychological benefits of knitting and other fiber arts. So did you learn anything new? What are your reactions to this area of research and the results about stress, depression, and well-being? What are your experiences with being a maker and coping with stress or feeling better about yourself? I always love hearing from you. Please let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And also, please feel free to comment if you have any questions about today's show or if you have an idea for what you'd like to see on future episodes or if you'd like to see a product tested. Leave your suggestions in the comment section below. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today and I'll see you in the next video. Now, before I go, I wanted to mention that this video marks the 16th episode in the U University YouTube series. If you've watched for a while, you might remember that I record sets of eight videos and then take a short break to give me time to prepare new material and shoot some new video footage. So that's what I'm going to be doing for the next few weeks. U University will be on summer break until the beginning of July. I'll be back on July 3rd with a new episode and you can look forward to some exciting new topics that I hope you will enjoy. In the meantime, take care everybody and have a sparkly week or a sparkly month. <music>